So we learned that many operators uh, we look at are actually compact operators. And uh, in fact, that's true for, for many of the applications in inverse problems. Um, we learned that uh, uh, operators with finite dimensional um, range are, um, are, con are compact. Um, kernel uh, integral operators are compact, and that, by the way, includes the radon transform, which is our main model for medical applications. So many of these actually are. But there's uh, one, uh, one type of inverse problem where this is maybe not completely obvious. And that was our main, actually our main example in the, in the first uh, section. And uh, that was inverse problems for PDEs. And now there's a, I mean, are these operators which we defined, are they also compact or are they not? And uh, if you're from PDEs, then uh, you will immediately say, yes, of course, because the solution can be represented as um, often a convolution, uh, integral convolution uh, with the initial data. So, uh, well, that's just an integral representation. It's just an integral operator. And that means that it's compact. Again, if you're not from PDEs, then this might not be that obvious. And uh, I want to take one example from the exercises and show you how you can easily prove that most of the operators, the continuous operators that we looked at, are in fact compact operators. And uh, I will take a look at, uh, I think that was exercise four on sheet two, and uh, maybe three, I don't know. Um, it, uh, it was about the Laplace equation. And uh, there was about um, electrocardiography. And uh, it boiled down to the following mathematical problem. You have the Laplace equation for a function u. And so you have uh, minus Laplace should be equal to 0 on the, uh, on the unit uh, sphere. And um, you, we have a directly boundary condition u equal to f on the boundary, so at norm x equals 1. And I should say that this all happens in R2. OK, so uh, what the, we defined an operator there, and that was in the addition. And uh, um, if uh, that was in the addition, and I did uh, the sample solution for that in a video. So if you've not already looked at that, uh, then you might look at it now and come back to this point a, bit, a little bit later. So the operator there, uh, which we defined, was the mapping from u on the uh, outside on the uh, u on the unit circle, so that was f directly boundary condition f, to u on a smaller circle inside uh, that uh, inside the big one. So we have a, a, um, a circle of radius one, that's the outside, and we have um, a circle of radius r zero. Uh, on in the inside, and um, we look at the mapping from the Dirichlet condition outside to u on the uh, on the inner circle, and uh, we look at the addition that I made there, uh, the additional assumption that u actually exists on all of the unit circle. So um, we have exactly the following setting: uh, k uh, f is assumed to be in L two of the unit circle and of course written in polar coordinates this can easily be parametrized by minus pi pi so i will take everything from minus pi pi so we have f in l2 of minus pi pi and we get a solution we, we get a result on the inner circle again that's parametrized on minus pi pi in polar coordinates so we have a mapping from L2 of minus pi pi. To well, a function on minus pi pi, and you can easily see, I think I mentioned that in the sample solution, that this is again in L2. Um, and uh, all this is true for R0 smaller than 1. And uh, of course, assuming uh, that u uh, is uh, um, uh, actually exists on all of the uh, unit circle. 
Okay, um, so the yeah, that's the mapping, and uh, so the, the operator itself is defined as k of of phi is u of r naught and phi in polar coordinates. Okay, so we map the outside to the inside, and we ask whether this is a compact operator. And uh, we do that in the following way. And uh, again, have a look at, at the video where I already did this. The solution of this problem is, of course, easily given. And uh, you can do that, for example, in the following way. We have f of phi. Uh, we have a function f of phi. And uh, um, f is in L2 of minus pi pi. So it has a Fourier series, right? So it has a convergent Fourier series um, with respect uh, to the L2 norm. So we can write it as sum over all k, a k e to the i k phi. And uh, of course, the Fourier coefficients can be easily computed, a k is 1 over 2 pi, the integral minus pi to pi, f of phi, e to the minus i k phi d e phi. Probably I should have written psi, but I'll do that later. OK, um, so uh, if, um, if that is true, so if the AK are the Fourier coefficients, then uh, you can easily write down by separation of variables the complete solution of the, um, uh, of the Laplace equation. And it's given by U of R and Psi, which is use Psi now, is sum of all K, AK, R to the absolute value of k, e to the i k psi. Now what we can do is we can plug in the definition of the a k's, and then we get something like, well, let me take the 1 over 2 pi out. Then we have something like sum over all k. And sum over all k means k from minus infinity to infinity, right? Sum over all k, a k now is the integral over minus pi to pi f of uh, phi e to the minus minus i k phi d phi. And uh, what did I forget? At least the r to the absolute value of k and an e to the i k psi. Now everything converges absolutely. So, um, I can interchange the order of summation and integration. And this is nothing but 1 over 2 pi integral minus pi to pi, sum over all k, uh, r to the absolute value of k. Then I have something like e to the um, minus i k. Let me write it this way, phi minus psi, right? I have I, uh, e to the i k psi and e to the minus i k phi. So I can write it in this way. And uh, that's uh, now um, uh, a d phi is missing. Am I missing anything else? Oh, the f, of course, f of phi d phi. OK, what you... Um, immediately see, well, this is exactly the kind of uh, integral operators that we looked at. And in fact, this one over here, if it exists, is the kernel function, k, which we always called k of phi and psi. And you see that in uh, this special case, we even have this is not only uh, a function um, of phi and psi, but it's also of the form g of phi minus psi. And that's exactly what we call the convolution. Well, I should write it the other way around, right, with a minus sign, and then it's, it matches the... Uh, 
then it matches the definition that I gave. Okay, um, so this is a convolution, but can we do uh, a little bit better? I mean, is that all convergent? I mean, it's obvious that it converges, but uh, let me do it a little bit better. And then the sum that I have there is uh, in fact conveniently written as, so, so I'm just taking that sum out. And this is the same as the sum from zero to infinity, r to the k, e to the minus i k phi minus psi, psi. So these are the positive values of k. And now I take the negative values of k and write it in the following form, sum from zero to infinity, r to the minus k, e to the minus, e to the plus, uh, excuse me, absolute value of k. So it's r to the k, e to the, but I there need to plug in minus k, i k times phi minus psi. And uh, uh, you can see that I had the zero term twice, so I need to subtract it. Okay, but uh, you can easily see these are now geometric series. So uh, yeah, let me just write it down shortly. So this is one over one minus r times e to the minus i phi minus psi. Um, plus one over one minus r to the e i phi minus psi. And this is just geometric series, minus one. And uh, what does this come up to? Well, if you, <laughs> I should use the ruler. Um, um, in the, the denominator, uh, we have one minus r times one uh, e to the minus i phi minus uh, times one minus r to the plus i phi minus psi. And uh, just taking the product, I get something like one plus r square, the e to the my cancel, minus i cancels. And then I have something like e to the minus i phi plus uh, e to the i phi, that's the cosine. So we get something like um, minus two r times the cosine of, uh, I think that's phi minus psi. And uh, since the cosine is even, this is also the cosine of psi minus phi. Okay, and uh, what we have up here, well, it's one minus r squared to the math yourself. So it's just taking everything to a common denominator. So uh, this is now a function g in phi minus psi, psi and psi minus phi, it's the same because the function is even. And now we, uh, we have that kf, oops, <laughs> great. We have that ku, kf of phi, psi, excuse me, kf of psi, is one over two pi times the integral zero to two pi um, g of uh, psi minus phi f of phi d phi and uh, in fact I've just inserted that formula here in this term. Right. Okay, and uh, of course that's exactly the kind of integral operators we've been looking at. That function is obviously for r. Ah, I'm I'm I've been writing r here. Excuse me. And um, yeah, 
Yeah. Um, this is for every fixed R. Excuse me, that's for every fixed R. But of course, we wanted to plug in R equals to R zero. So um, if we set if we set R equal to R zero here, if we set R equals to R zero, um, then we get the operator that we've been looking at, right? I mean, this was valid for every R, but in the definition of K, we only, we had set uh, the inner radius to R naught, so we need to plug this in here. Okay, for uh, R zero, uh, for R equals to R zero, smaller than one, this is obviously an L2 function on minus pi pi. I have written zero to two pi. This should be minus pi pi. I like to, it's exactly the same thing because uh, everything is just uh, periodic, but uh, I like to uh, restrict myself to the interval from minus, to the symmetric interval from minus pi to pi, and we'll use uh, discrete Fourier transforms quite a lot for our periodic functions, and I'll always look at these in on minus pi pi, I hope. Uh, that makes a lot of things um, a lot easier. Okay, uh, so this is L2 of minus pi pi. And that means that uh, the operator that we've been looking at is compact. And that already, of course, means that uh, K is continuous. But this was evident anyway uh, by the representation. Okay, so K is a continuous operator, but uh, of course there's also another thing, K to the minus one, which is in fact not completely, but um, which um, defined, um, because it doesn't always exist, but if it exists, K minus one G for any function g on the inner circle. So mapping from the inner circle to the outer circle, that would be the reverse, must be discontinuous. Whenever that k minus one g at all exists. Okay, so uh, we have all the nice operator, we have all the nice um, properties now of compact operators. And in fact, uh, the reason I let you do so many of uh, these um, inverse problems for PDEs is you can, for all of the, of the forward operators that we looked at that were continuous, uh, you can easily show that these are in fact compact operators. So uh, all the theory, we, the theory we're doing right now definitely applies to these. Okay. Ah, and uh, I think this is the last movie for last recording for today. Uh, on Thursday, I'll continue with the singular value decomposition. <laughs>